Uh, well, uh, we're kind of doing a Q&A tonight, and this is uh, different for us. We do about one of these a year, to, uh, depending on the topic, and it's a great chance because we know that whatever we're preaching about, there's always questions. People are like, I don't, I don't know, you know, I wish, I wish they'd answer this question or that question. And so we thought, you know what, let's, let's do that. Let's give you an opportunity to ask us questions, and, uh, and we just want to serve you. We're not encyclopedias. If you're like, where does it say in the Bible that... Uh, I may or may not be able to answer you. I, I don't know. I mean, but, but, if, but if we can serve you and, and if there's questions you have, we just want you to know there's nothing off limits, okay? Uh, I've said things in church the last three weeks that some of you thought you'd never hear in church. And, uh, and so you're texting, and I want you to know as you do text to this number, it's anonymous, okay? We don't know who it's from. This is a service that we set up that is not one of the staff numbers, phone numbers. Um, and so you can, you can send their, your, phone, your, your question to that number. We won't know who it is, and they're kind of going to be able to go through them, and, and they'll throw them up on the screen as, as, we, uh, as we go through this. And so, again, we just want to serve you, want to help you, and, uh, and hopefully that will do it. But let me, uh, let me have my beautiful bride, Michelle, come up here and, uh, and help me with this. And baby, thank you. Michelle has been... Yeah, there you go. Ready? Got it? She's, uh, she's, she's been great. She's been uh, like, oh, really, do I have to do this? And, and I said, well, you don't I have to. I prayed I'd break and, my leg or that yeah. I would have a really bad illness this week. But God obviously didn't have that in the plan. So uh, I'm here, very so, healthy. Yeah, so here we are. <laughs> Uh, before we do, we've been giving away a book every week, and uh, we were just talking about it, what should we do, and uh, we decided, hey, we, we know sometimes people have really long engagements, and sometimes you have really short engagements. So how many of you were engaged less than six months between the time he asked you to marry him and the time you got married? Less than six months. How many of you? Okay. Anybody engaged less than three months? Okay. Are we going to, we're out already? Okay. Wow. Okay. Go back to the six months or Like how long, how long, Nancy and Dave? Six months. Six months? Oh. Wow, six? Anybody less? We win the book then because we were like three. What'd you guys do? <laughs> how long? Good Lord. All right. How long oh. have you been married? Three? Okay, there's a book. Get, get two of those. John, grab this one and this one. You guys raise your hands. Right there. Ryan, right? Ryan. Ryan. And, uh, and back in there. Yeah, give them, give them a book. There you go. There you go. Nice. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to do this, and uh, we're just going to see what questions you have. I don't want you to be embarrassed. Um, you know, we'll be the ones who are embarrassed, okay? We'll, we'll do that for you. Uh, let me kind of um, set the stage here, because when it comes to, we've talked about sex, and if you have questions about sex, I want you to feel free to, to ask those. Um, uh, I think Mark and Grace Driscoll do a great job in this book, and I would encourage all of you to get the book if you're married or if you're planning on getting married, and that would be 90% of the American public. Um, <laughs> but they do a great job of, of uh, they, they go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, where Paul is answering the questions of the Corinthians. And it's in the context of sexual immorality. It's the context of what can we do and what can't we do. And, uh, and Paul says this, he, 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 say, he quotes them where they say, all things are lawful, and he says, yeah, but not all things are helpful. And then he quotes him again, all things are lawful. And he says, yes, but I won't be enslaved by any of them. Okay, so there's this, there's this kind of rubric that he gives us through which we can ask and answer questions. And, 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 and especially when it comes to sex within marriage, that we ask, is it helpful Okay, or first, I guess, is it lawful? In other words, is it, is it biblical? Is there anything in the Bible that would forbid this? Or, you know, we, you know as a couple, we're, we're thinking about this or whatever, and would the Bible forbid that? Um, but the second question isn't just, does it forbid it? The second question, is it helpful? Okay, because it may not be forbidden, but it might not be helpful. Okay, and, and so you got to look at that. And then the third question is, is, is it enslaving? Is there something about this particular thing, whatever it is, that could be enslaving, okay? And so if you think about it, is it lawful? Is it biblical? Is it helpful? Well, there's all kinds of reasons. We talked a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, about why sex is helpful in marriage. And it's a comfort. It's a protection. It's pleasurable. It produces children. I mean, we went, we, I think we gave about six different reasons why sex is a good thing in marriage, okay? Well, is it helpful in one of those ways? It might be. 
And then is it enslaving? Is this particular thing that you're asking about, is it something that would be uh, enslaving to you? So now, all the questions don't have to be about sex, but if they are, I just want you to know uh, that's kind of the rubric we're going to run things through. And I think it's really helpful for you to try and figure out and categorize what, what, is, what is good and, uh, and what may not be helpful. Okay? So guys, we have a question back there, and we can, we can start going. Um, is it okay for a married woman to take the pill to prevent pregnancy? Well, yeah, okay, let, let's talk about this. The pill is very common. I mean, I, 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 I don't know anymore what the, uh, what the stats are on, on how many women that are trying to prevent pregnancy and how many couples uh, uh, take the pill. Um, there's something you, you need to be very aware of this. I'm not a doctor, but I will say there's all kinds of studies that have been written about this. Uh, that, that uh, the, the pills aren't always what you might think they are. Okay, there, there's basically pills that prevent sperm and egg from uniting. Okay, and they do that in a variety of ways, but they, but they, they prevent that or make it very, very difficult. Okay, and, and that would be something we'd say, okay, well, there's, there was not a conception didn't happen, and so therefore that would be, that would be acceptable. Okay. But there's other kinds of pills that allow the sperm and the egg to unite, but don't allow the sperm and the egg to lodge in the, the woman's uterus, okay? That's, that's preventing, there's a, there's a child already formed, okay? As Christians, we believe that child is the moment of conception, not six months, not when we see a heartbeat, nothing like that. It's immediate. And when you prevent that, then, then that, is, that is, in essence, an abortifacient. That is, it causes an abortion. And that's a life, and you're taking a life. So I only say this, that, that if, you, if you deem that the pill is what you want to do, and you're saying, man, I want to do this right, and I don't, I don't want that to be happening. Well, I know there's medical side effects to them. I'll let Michelle talk about some of this, but, but I also... Uh, want you to just be really, really careful that you're not accidentally aborting a child and thinking, I, I just thought I was taking the pill. I thought it was preventing this thing because they don't all work that way. And you need to kind of study up on that and, and make sure, okay? I, um, I, I would say if you just really want to be sure, there's other things. There, there's other things. I mean, you can use other contraceptives, condoms, other things that, that are about 98 Point nine, you know, if you use them right, effective in preventing. Some people use what they call the rhythm method or things like that to make sure that, you know, if a woman's ovulating and, you know, you don't have sex during those times. So, so uh, that's something that you as husband and wife need to talk about, and I would just counsel you to be very careful about uh, what you might do. You might, I mean, w you took the pill for, uh, and we well, didn't really five, know this, yeah. Yeah, for five years, um, because we, he was in school, and I'd, we we'd had plans and really prayed through the fact that I should uh, uh, stay home uh, when, when our kids are born. It was a really important core value for us. So we want to make sure that we didn't have children while he was in law school. That was school round number one. And um, so we did that. Now, you know, with information I know now, maybe I would have not, uh, had not done that. And then after the fact, we di I didn't take the pill. We used other methods. And I think one thing that you have to think through, though, is... Um, the whole idea of family planning in general, don't take it lightly and don't, you need to really prayerfully talk about, you know, what God is calling your family to do as far as having children in general. And if you're taking any kind of birth control because, you know, you don't want to have children for, you know, the wrong reasons. Remember, the Lord tells us in the Bible to be fruitful and multiply, and children are a blessing. Mm -hmm. They're not a curse. And, you know, we our society, I think Chris talked about it, goes one or two ways with kids. They're either idols or we, we treat them like curses. There's a balance that God wants us to strike, and he wants us to have children. I mean, other cultures and nations are having children like crazy, and why aren't Christians? So before you decide to uh, use contraceptives uh, for, the, for the long haul and not enjoy the blessing of children, prayerfully consider why that would be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm glad we have the four children we have, and um, if I could have more, I would, so. <laughs> she would. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they are a blessing, The yeah. quiver is full, and so. You know what, we're not, we're not, by, by this, we, we're not one of these that say you can't, you can't, yeah. 
take birth control or, or things like that uh, to, prevent, to prevent pregnancy. I think you have to prayerfully, as Michelle said that, we're not saying everybody ought to be the Duggar family, um, uh, but, you know, and just have babies. Uh, and that's fine. That's great for them, and I'm not, not condemning them. I'm just saying that that's something that I think you have to really seriously consider for yourselves and, and what God has, uh, has in store for your family. So, good, good question. What's the next question? Can you use explicit language during sex? Okay, that's a great question. Um, well, I, I'm assuming this means, you know, like, like you know, harsh, uh, <laughs> crying out, whatever. Uh, if you mean by explicit language what we would call curse words, right? Um, the F word, I mean, whatever. You're using words that in normal conversation are, are considered to be unwholesome. Um, my position on this is the Bible says don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now, now th- there are things that you might say during sex that are perfectly fine between a husband and wife, but they are not perfectly fine in everyday conversation. And if it's a curse word, okay, first of all, talk to each other about that. Because, because while one of you may think that's a real turn-on, the other may be saying, that's a real turn-off. And that doesn't do anything for me. And, and you know, your, your freedom of talking like that is offensive to me. So, so again, you, you need to talk and have these kind of conversations where you understand honestly uh, how each other feels about these things, okay? Be careful. I don't think... The Bible says you can let any unwholesome... Taking the Lord's name in vain is never acceptable. I don't care if you're having sex or you're not having sex, right? It's never acceptable. Okay, saying certain things are not, are not helpful and they're, and they're um, polluting. I mean, the Bible talks about how our mouths are... I mean, what comes out of our mouth is coming out of our heart. And so we have to be real, real careful, I think, of that kind of thing. Do you, you want to add to that at all? Do I have to? No, you don't. Okay. No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I would just say that that would be the case with just probably anything that you experience, you know, when you make love is that you just have to, to work that out with your spouse and make sure, you know, whether it's language or other things that we may talk about tonight, that you talk about it, not like at the time, but probably before <laughs> another time when it's not so like romantic, maybe over coffee and talk about those things like what, you know, what is, what is pleasing to you? What is exciting to you? What is important to you to hear and not hear and do and not do? It's important to talk about those things because uh, one of our, I think Pastor Stephen, when we were in a, a pre-marriage group with him and some others, one of the things that he and Katie have kind of lived by is unsaid is unmet. Your unsaid expectations never get met, right? If you don't say, this bugs me, how, how can you expect your spouse to know? They're not going to read your mind, even though we think they should. Of course they should, but they can't. So you have to talk about these things at times when it's more appropriate and, and you're yeah. able to do that. Good, good. Okay, next question. There we go. Okay, you said sex was for the protection of couples from eternal... External. External. Okay, sorry. That, that makes a difference. Uh, <laughs> lust and temptation. What do singles have for protection? Is masturbation a viable option? Okay, well, let's talk about what, what singles have. Okay, God has given this thing called, um, let's say, sexual intercourse to happen during marriage. That's boundaries. Okay. Jesus spent 33 years not having sex. Paul, we don't know how old Paul was. Paul, Paul could have been 60, 70 years old when he died, uh, didn't have sex. Okay, so, so what, what protection do you have from lust? Well, um, and, and temptation, you, you have Jesus first and foremost, Okay, and that is that we find our ultimate satisfaction in him and we learn to discipline our minds. Okay, that, that, is, a, that is a learned skill, if you will, and it's a godly grace that God helps us so that I don't let my mind just wander into lust. I, 
I take every thought captive and say, look, I know God, and you remind yourself that you've got, let's say for me as a man, and I'm not married, let's say, you've got a woman that you've planned for me someday where this can be taken care of, where God, you're going to help me. Somebody sent me an email the other day saying, I battle with lust. I'm a man, I battle with lust, and do I need to take care of that problem and get rid of it before I get married? So in other words, i got to clean up house before I can get married. I said, look, yeah, you, lust, is, lust is bad. Lust is a sin. Let's call it what it is. But on the other hand, one of the ways God has given us for, for managing that lust is marriage. And he said, look, you, you can lust over your wife. It's not considered lust. All you want or your husband, right? That, that this is an avenue that he's given us uh, to, to battle that temptation. But if you're single, look, I know that's an issue. I know that's hard. But you've got to be, be very careful that you're saying, God, you know, help me to channel that for the right time when, when you've got somebody in store for me. And, and, and when I feel that lust, maybe what I do is I pray for that person in my future. And I pray for her right now. I pray for him right now that you keep them pure and keep their thought life pure so that when we come together, God, it's a beautiful thing that you've planned for us. Now, is masturbation okay? Well, okay, let's kind of use that rubric that I talked about. Is it lawful? In other words, is there anything in Scripture that would prohibit it? No. No, There's nothing, and I don't know, you know, uh, there's nowhere in Scripture that I can think of that, uh, that prohibits. Somebody would say, well, Onan spilled his semen uh, in, I think, Genesis 34 or something like that. Well, that's not masturbation. That was Onan, uh, that was, you know, pulling out before he ejaculated, and, and there's a whole sin in that because of what that meant in that culture. Okay, so that's not masturbation. And in fact, in the Song of Solomon, there is, there is um, certainly talk in, uh, uh, I think it's chapter 4, where it talks about uh, the man manually stimulating the woman, okay? Uh, well, we may say, well, that's not masturbation per se, but it is, it's something other than sexual intercourse, okay? But the Bible does not prohibit uh, a man or a woman from masturbating. So is it lawful? We'd have to say, yeah. Okay, now some of you may disagree with me, and that's okay. We can talk about this. But is it lawful? Yeah. But is it helpful? The, uh, believe it or not, I actually did a lot of reading, more than I wanted to, on the issue of masturbation a couple weeks ago as we were looking at this whole thing. It's very, very common. Um, is it helpful? Well, here's, here's the problem. If you're single and you masturbate, okay? We talked about a couple weeks ago how porn- pornography, or last week we talked about how pornography sort of creates these neural pathways. If you're single, there's something that is, that is um, you're bonding with in this act of singular sex, okay? And so you have to wonder whether or not it's a helpful thing for you to be doing. Is it helpful for you? Well, it relieves stress. It, whatever. You could come to all kinds of, well, there's these, there's these, it protects me from lusting. Okay, but what are you thinking about while you're masturbating? Because I, I don't know very many people that would say, my mind's just empty. Right? You're focused on something. You're probably fantasizing about something. Okay? And that something or someone, uh, that would be, lust par excellence, right? I mean, this is like I'm, I'm lusting and I'm masturbating and it's sort of the fulfillment of all this. Okay, so I think you have to be careful of that. Um, is, it, is it lawful? Is it helpful? And is it enslaving? Well, the fact of the matter is, is it can be enslaving. It can be something that, that becomes very, very, um, you become conditioned to uh, and you, you, you know, you, 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 you you really have to wrestle through that. And, and there's some, I've, I've had to talk with some men who even struggle with masturbation after they're married because they got so fixated on something in this act and the way they bonded with something that for them to have normal intercourse during marriage uh, was not what they thought it would be. And, and so they resorted back uh, to masturbation. 
Okay, so, I mean, th- th- there's things in here like parents. How should we view that and with our, our children? And, you know, it's mostly common among boys, but it's increasingly common among girls. That's a different discussion, but I would say that's still the same kind of rubric. Uh, but, but if you're a single guy, a single gal, and that's your issue, I would say be very, very careful because you know, as, as well as I do, that can become very habitual. And if it becomes habitual, okay, here's what God is saying. Go out and find a wife. And I'm not saying you just go run and find anybody who will be your wife or your, or your husband. He's saying that's the legitimate uh, expression of your sexuality. And so this is why Paul says to young men and women, boy, get married. Better, better be married than burn with lust. So you see what he's saying? Paul recognized we're fallen creatures and lust is a problem for us. And so ask God, help me, Lord. I want to find this person that you have for me. I'm not just going to rush out and marry the first guy that says he loves me or first gal who, you know, shows interest in me. But, but I do want to find this person. And, and I don't want to carry this into marriage. And I want marriage to be the legitimate expression of, of, my, uh, uh, of my sexuality for, for what you have for me. Okay, is that, that you want to add any other Yeah, just one other thing. Um, I think that it also begs the question, um, you, we notice, we're noticing more and more that people are putting off marriage till later in life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can see why that would be a choice because, you know, you want to get your college. And I mean, that's why we didn't have kids right away because we wanted to, you know, get Chris through school before we started having children, that kind of thing. I totally see that as an option. But I think we have to be careful about that because what we're telling our young people is, don't get married till you're 30. Oh, but by the way, don't have sex before you're married too. <laughs> when they're at this prime age in their 20s that they're, you know, that's a very big part of their lives. So are we as parents not helping our children maybe to prepare them earlier to get married, have a job, all the things we want them to have, um, and preparing them earlier to do that rather than pushing them off and also telling them, by the way, stay uh, sexually pure and, you know, don't masturbate and do all these other things because we, uh, you know, we don't want you to do that, but oh, don't get married till you're 30. Yeah. I, I think that's a mixed message that as parents, I mean, I have to walk through that too because, you know, my, I have an oldest that's 18 now and I'm like, I'm not sure I'm ready for her to get married. But on the other hand, I'm like, you know, if God brought a wonderful guy in her life, I'd be okay with that in like five or 10 more years. I'm just kidding. Sorry, yeah. No, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I think we have to take that very circumspectly as parents and not, you know, we've kind of flip-flopped on that. People used to get married really young. There's mistakes in that too. I understand, you know, people say, oh, I got married too young. Well, we got married really young too. We were kind of stupid. We didn't know what we, what we to do, but at the same time, God was good and we kind of grew up together. Yeah. And sometimes when you put it off too long, one person's grown up one way, another one's grown up another way, and you can't get through some of those hard knocks together that maybe you need to. So yeah. that's kind of another that's good. part. That's good. Okay. All right. I believe sex to be, is this the right one? Yeah. Bountiful and abundant in my marriage. My wife wants it to be rationed. <laughs> Where do we meet? Okay. So it sounds to me like you got a guy who really loves having sex, a girl who's saying, uh, let's only do it this many times a month. I don't know. Something like that. Uh, where do we meet? You want to you tackle that oh, one? Boy. Sure. Um, <laughs> give me the real hard one right first off. But, um, well, I think that that's a common problem, right? A common issue that comes up because of the way God created men and women. And I've, I've even laughed about it myself with Chris. I'm like, I, I think it's really interesting how God created men and women so different with their appetites. Now, that's not by and large. I mean, sometimes some women are, you know, want to have sex more than their husbands. That doesn't happen very often. Um, but sometimes that happens. Um, I would say, again, where you start with that is the communication and not like, you know, during lovemaking or when you're in a real big argument or something, but in a time that is non-threatening to either one of you um, and talk about what is acceptable and what seems reasonable and rational. Um, I don't think that it's rational as um, for our husband's to, you know, to, for us to, to withhold sex from them on a regular basis. I don't think it's rational to think that we would say only sex once a week. I mean, I think, um, you know, that's, that's, we've come down to the situation where we literally have a, what Chris talked about before, a schedule and a plan because our lives are so busy, like many of yours. I know women, you're tired. I know I've been tired too, but we cannot use tired as an excuse to not love our husbands the way that they need and deserve to be loved. We 
would never let them come home and say to us, I'm tired, honey, I can't engage with the kids. I'm tired, honey, I can't go to my job today. We would freak out if we, if we wouldn't feel loved, right? We wouldn't feel protected, we wouldn't feel provided for. But every time we use an excuse to not make love to them, we're doing the same thing to them. Now, again, that being said, I totally get the tired. I've had four kids and it doesn't, I don't get any less tired, even though they're getting bigger, I get more tired. We've got a busy life like many of you. So that's why I say, come together at a non-threatening time and talk about your expectations. I do think that sex in a marriage should be bountiful and abundant, but you as a couple have to decide what that looks like and come to an agreement so that you won't develop bitterness on either side. You don't want your husband to be bitter to you and a wife, you just surely don't want to be bitter toward your husband and feel like it's a demand. We need to pray as women that our sex lives with our husbands become a delight and not a duty. And I'm telling you, as someone that's been married for 23 years now, sometimes it's more delight than it's been more delight than duty and, and vice versa. But I am consistent to pray that it becomes more of a delight all the time. Because I'm my body is not my own. My life's not my own. It belongs to Jesus first and foremost, and then it belongs to my husband. I committed to that when I got married at 21. See, that's what I was maybe stupid. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, right? But I'm committed to that, and so I need to work on my marriage, and that's one really big way to do that. Awesome. I Anything can't else? add to that. No, okay. that's great. Yeah. But hey, by the way, for any of you women, if you do want to talk about these things other times, I'm no, more than happy to talk to you about this kind of stuff, you know, on the, was it the DL? Is that the right thing Something to like say? That. I don't know. <laughs> DL? I don't know any of these terms. My kids know. We'll just go to coffee, okay? We can just do coffee. So anytime. So. <laughs> All right. What should I do if my husband is looking at pornography? Is it grounds for divorce? Well, let, let me, can I tackle the second part first and what should I do with my husband? Let me, let me talk about is it grounds for divorce? It might be. Um, sexual immorality is grounds for divorce. Now, uh, there's a word the Bible uses, porneia, that covers all kinds of things. And, uh, and pornography would be one of those things. If the pornography has risen to such a level, now, now let me, so let me say it this way. You know, you, you caught him... Um, looking at a, a porn website, and as far as you know, it's the first and last time he did it. Okay, I, 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 would, I would say, don't, don't divorce the man, right? That, that's, that, is it sexual immorality? Yes. Is it grounds for divorce? Probably not, okay. But I've met women, and I know families, where pornography has risen to such a level that it was an addiction it was something that destroyed their sex life. It's something that warped his mind, and this can happen to women too, and, and had so polluted the bed and their marriage that it was as if um, uh, he had and was having an ongoing affair with a lot of other women. Yeah. I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying, is it permissible? Yeah, I would say there are, there are situations where pornography absolutely would give you grounds for divorce. Um, and, and, you know, you want to be careful with that. You want to listen to God. You don't want to just automatically assume that, that, uh, that that's what you should do. Uh, we don't, we, we want to always be on the side of God can heal and reconcile and his grace can, can, uh, can redeem that kind of thing. But, but at the same time, uh, the Bible would, would allow for that. Now, what should you do if your husband, and I'm going to take this to mean um, is uh, habitually, okay? I know there's a lot of guys, and I'm not excusing you, by the way, guys, at all. The Bible says there shouldn't even be a hint of sexual immorality, okay? Don't excuse yourself by saying, I'm going to look at it once a month. That's bull. Don't look at it at all. Stop it entirely, okay? But... I know what happens, and I know there's guys that struggle with that, okay? So, so what should I do if your husband is looking at pornography? And I'm going to take this to mean on more of a habitual basis. How, how can you help him? What, how would you talk to a wife that would, that would ask you that? Oh, that is tough. Well, first of all, my heart goes out to you because I think that would be really a tough thing and call for a lot of, a lot of grace and love and mercy. I think you have to go back to that question again about how is your own personal sex life with your husband? 
Okay, again, I'm not making any kind of remote excuse that, well, my, husband's, my wife's not having sex with me, so I'm going to look at pornography. That is not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, have you been withholding yourself for no good reason other than your stubbornness and your uh, selfishness from your husband for an extended period of time that has driven him to do some things that maybe he would normally not do? That's step one. If that answer is no, I have been, you know, taking my marital vows seriously. I've been loving him. I've been doing things for him that I need to do. It's probably time to get some outside counseling. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think there's anything I can say, you know, I've, uh, that would be helpful other than, than that. Um, I think you do have to confront the issue, um, but it's probably good at that point to bring in uh, a third party to do that. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, th I think if he's, if he's struggling and if it's he's habitual, willing to talk yeah. about it, like he's willing to engage with that and he hates what he's doing, there's great hope. There's really great hope. If he is recalcitrant and like, you know what, I think I should be able to do this. Um, I don't think there's any problem with looking at a nude woman. Um, you know, I'm assuming you've had the conversation that talks about, that, that would tell him how degrading that feels, how you feel like, you know, because guys, look, she, she cannot compete with that. And the reason she can't compete with that is it's not reality. It's not even true. Okay, the thing you're seeing on the screen is a lie. And if you could talk to that porn star and say, are you really enjoying it as much as it looks like? She'd tell you no. Okay, it's a lie. And you're believing a lie, okay? What your husband needs to understand is what we talked about last week. He's an idolater. Ultimately, he's worshiping an idol. He's worshiping that woman. He's worshiping sex. And his, his redemption is Jesus Christ. His redemption is he stops worshiping porn, stops worshiping that idol, and starts worshiping Jesus. That's the answer. Okay, and now I don't mean that to sound simplistic. I mean, that's ultimately. If he's absolutely, if he's habitually, you know, engaged in this and is absolutely unwilling to bend on this issue, then you have a problem. I mean, you, you, you've got a big problem. And, and that's why, you know, what I said in the beginning, is it grounds to divorce? It might be. It might be. And I hate to say that. I mean, I never want to see a couple get a divorce. But, but this so pollutes and betrays, guys, you have to understand this. This is not something, I was just, I was, I was flipping the TV the other day, and I hear this guy say something about porn, and I, we were talking about this, so I stopped, and I wanted to hear what he'd say, and, and there was this kind of game show, and somebody was asking him, does he know, can he name something like three porn stars, and he did it, and his wife looked at him like, What? And he's like, you know, yeah, I don't see it. And then, and then the next question was about him being a Christian. Like, what kind of screwed up, messed up? That is so whacked, I can't even tell you. On the one hand, I'm watching it, I have no regret. On the other hand, I'm claiming Jesus to be my Savior. No way. No way. And guys, you cannot, you cannot, I mean, that ought to grieve you. And listen, if it does grieve you, if you look at it and you feel guilt, you feel conviction. We've, our society tells us guilt isn't good. No, conviction is really good when you sin against God. And if you feel that conviction, that's a good thing. And you need to follow that trail and say, God, deliver me. Man, I'm worshiping something that isn't you. And I want, I want to worship Jesus. And I want to find that ultimate satisfaction in my wife, not in a fake image on a page. And God can heal you. I know he can, and he will if you're willing to be, okay? So hopefully, hopefully that helps. All right, next one. How far is too far with sexual experimentation within marriage, anal sex, toys, watching porn together? Okay, well, those are a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so let me just say, sexual experimentation, let's just talk about that in generic terms. There's nothing wrong with sexual experimentation. Can it go too far? Okay, so let's talk about uh, anal sex. Let's talk about each of these because I think, I think if, you, if you look at it, is it lawful? Is it helpful? Is it enslaving? Okay, is it lawful? Is anal sex and marriage lawful? Well, the answer is, yeah, there's nothing, can, that, that someone's going to surprise from you that I would say this, there's nothing in, in, in Scripture that forbids it, okay? So you'd say, wait a second, that's sodomy. No, it's not. No, sodomy comes from 
uh, Genesis where, where God judges Sodom and the men of Sodom because they wanted to have homosexual sex with Lot. Okay? The, the Bible never uses the word sodomy again. It uses homosexuality. That's condemned. Okay? So, now, is it, is it lawful? Okay, so we could say, and I'm just being very general and very quick here, is it lawful? Is there anything in the Bible that would permit, per, pro, uh, 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 prohibit it? No. Is it helpful? Well, I think that's really open to debate, right? Um, infection, pain, um, shame. Th- there can be things that, that are very damaging to your sexual relationship if you're not careful. Now, could there be an instance where a couple would do that and there would be no pain, there would be no shame, there, there would be none of, the, none of that sinful baggage that goes, I suppose so. Um, and so you could then go to the next one and say, well, then is it enslaving? Well, there again, it could be. It could be enslaving. And that is that if that becomes something where, you know, there, there isn't normal sexual intercourse happening in marriage and you rely upon that, then I think that's enslaving. And I don't think that's what God intended for it to always be. Okay, so, so you know, I think there's a lot of other better options. Okay, let me just say that. Um, and that, that, that you need to be careful because that could be very demeaning. Okay, let's say a guy had a past with homosexuality. What, what kind of images or things would that bring up for him? Okay, that, 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 so, so I can see where it would be very, very unhelpful and, and possibly enslaving. Okay, sex toys. Well, um, toys, is there anything unbiblical? I mean, is there some, some prohibition? No. Um, is it helpful? Well, I suppose. I, again, I don't know what toys are out there, but um, if it, again, what are we talking about when we say is it, is it beneficial, um, helpful, is it pleasurable? Does it bring you more pleasure as a couple? Does it, uh, does it bring more protection, whatever? And then, then I think you could answer and say there might be instances where the toy could, could be helpful if it's not done alone, Okay. If it's something that is together, okay, there, there, are, there, are, there are sex toys out there that do what no human body can do for you. Now, I only say that to say you must be very, very careful if you're going to do that because suddenly you can become sort of fixated on that sensation that he or she cannot provide for you and now that's the only way you can be satisfied sexually. Okay, so can it be enslaving? Yeah, I think it can be. Um, I, think, I think it absolutely can be, could be enslaving if you're, if you're not careful. And I think, I, let me, and by the way, one caution, um, where do you get these sex toys? Because most often you're going to have, now there are Christian places out there, I know that, and you better be very sure that you're looking at one of them. But if you go on the internet, there's a very good likelihood you're going to be pulling up pornographic images before your eyes, and you don't want to do that. Um, and, and so you've got to be careful about that. Okay, watching porn together, absolutely not. Why? Why? So now I've got to look at another couple having sex for that to be something that... Now, now so I, I've completely hold myself out. I'm being turned on by the image of somebody else having sex. And now I need that to sort of rev the engine, if you will, in order to enjoy my wife. It must never be. That will, again, you, you'll suddenly be like, if it, doesn't, if it doesn't hit the highs of a pornographic film, it ain't sex. No. Look, any healthy married couple will tell you there's great days and there's ordinary days sexually, Right? It's not always a pornographic film. And and we shouldn't be striving. That's not our goal. The goal is not how much, you know, she can please me and make me feel like I'm in a porn movie. The goal is, is the husband loving his wife enough to please her and the wife loving her husband enough to please him. And I think when you bring porn into it, you are opening up 
a world of imagery and, and things happening there that I think can absolutely pollute your marriage bed. And I've heard of couples that say, hey, we both love it. I, I, think, I think you're playing with fire that I think is ultimately going to be very, very damaging to your relationship. What would you say about that? about the porn especially. Yeah, I think that's tough. I mean, you know, and I think that's right. I mean, and, and you have to even maybe redefine what that looks like. I mean, I know for me, I don't like to watch films, um, even regular film like a PG-13 or an R where I may see people together in bed. I don't want any of those images in my head at all. And so, you know, we were talking about it the other day. I mean, it's just amazing how as, as the society has moved on, we become more desensitized to what's out there and even things that we laugh at. We were talking about that, or like you'd mentioned that a couple weeks ago about, you know, them laughing about the thing from Indiana Jones. We do that and we allow ourselves to see, you know, maybe we want to call it soft porn, but I mean, how many movies have we seen on TV or otherwise that will show people in those situations where, you know, I think we have to watch and guard our hearts and, uh, and our minds at all times. So yeah. we got to be careful about that. Yeah. Okay. All right, a couple more. What's the next one? My spouse admitted to fan fantasizing about others. How do we regain the purity uh, we had before this? Um, well, obviously this is very, very painful that in the, you know, whether in the act of making love to your spouse, he or she was fantasizing or they had, again, I, without the full context of this, was it something that they, they consistently gave into? Okay, there, there's a difference between the fleeting thought of lust, okay, wh which I'm not excusing, by the way, and full on, I let my mind wander into that sort of fantasy realm and really give my thought life to it. Um, that's damaging. I told you last week, that's why I define porn the way I do. You use that with the intent of, of satisfying yourself sexually, not with your spouse. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's very, very damaging. Now, how do you regain the purity? I think, I, I, you know, I'm guessing the problem is, is you don't know if they're fantasizing or not. Um, and so I just want you to hear this. This is why these kinds of things are so damaging. Not because there's no hope. There's obviously hope. Jesus Christ can cleanse your minds. Jesus Christ can purify you. Jesus Christ can, can cause you. But, but where's, where's the fantasy coming in? Is it, is it PG-13 movies? And, and, and you realize, you know, we take that lightly in our home. And, and we've not really ever put guards around our mind in that regard? Is it, um, is it he looks at porn? Or is it just, you know, he, he thought about a girl from high school that he used to date and he's fantasizing about her? Okay, listen, you've got, listen, if you're thinking about anybody but your spouse as you make love to them, that's sin. You've suddenly, they've become a body and you're out of your body thinking about how you would be doing this with another person. That's adultery, right? That is, that is spiritual, mental adultery. That's what the Bible calls it. And so you can't, you can't excuse yourself and say, yeah, but I didn't actually have sex. Yeah, well, Jesus says that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still adultery. If a man looks at a woman and lusts in his heart, okay? So now you've got the image of her in your mind and you're lusting about her as you're making love to your wife. That's, that's adultery, Okay, now what, what do you do about that? Guys, gals, whichever it is, you, you have to, again, train your mind and focus. You have to focus, if this is one of your problems, on your spouse. And you've got to empty. You've got to take out the garbage in your marriage and go, in order, if, if, if to get there, I've got to watch Pixar films and Disneyland and nothing else. I'll do it. I'm not watching, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rid myself of the garbage that I allow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, I used to drive on the way to work and there'd be these billboards. They're all over Southern California, right? You know, adult con or whatever, you know, these conferences, these large-breasted women staring at you very salaciously. 
what do you do? You could see that and you could go, ah, here I go and I'm going to fantasize. Or you can say, look, guys, we can't help seeing things, right? You see it. That's not the issue. What do you do with it? You seize that moment right there. You got about three seconds, and I kid you not, you got about three seconds to say, stop. And Jesus, help me. And you turn and you start focusing your mind on things of God. This is why you should be in the Word of God. This is why you should be filling your mind, letting your mind focus and concentrate on the things of God. Fantasize about your wife at that moment, if that helps. And I'm serious. Turn from that and go, oh, you know what? God's given me an outlet for that and praise God and I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my husband and I'm going to think about them right now and replace that image and put them in that spot because that's what God intended for you to enjoy. Okay, now for this couple, I don't know. I don't know what's happened. I don't know the extent of it. If you want to come talk, we, that, we'd love to talk to you. But, but uh, this is one of those things that you're going to have to work through. And, and, and patiently and, and, and ask God, if you're the man that's engaged this, God, help me. Help me to, to control and to, and to purify my mind the way you want it for me. Okay? Let's take one more, guys, and then we'll, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here. How do you talk to your kids about the possibility that dad or mom may not come home from work as a police officer, firefighter, or military personnel? Is that what we're talking about? That's what I think. Yeah, go ahead. Can, can we clarify? It's, uh, I'm guessing it means, you know, like I know like a lot of my friends, well, Unless like Chris's brother. Like they're, like they're gone. Well, no, they're just gone for a while. That's what I would take it as. Or may not come, come home. Come home. Oh, come home. Like ever come home. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah I think that's what that means. Okay. I'm going to, why don't we take it that way? Go ahead. Should we take it that yeah. way? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, that's a tough one. Uh, Oh, these questions are so good, you guys. Thank you so much for asking such good, hard questions, really. Let, um, me, let me just say something real yeah. quick. I, 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 don't think you, I don't think you jump the, pardon me for the metaphor here, you jump the gun on this one. Um, I don't think you, you know, little children, you, you know, they, they, it depends on the age of your kids. You know, a teenager can handle a lot more than a three-year-old. You know, we have a 10-year-old in our home, and my father just died uh, on May 1st, and it got her thinking about death. Well, that's a terrifying prospect. Okay, now we can talk to her about that because now the, the issue has come up. But, you know, someday mommy and daddy will die. And, you know, by the grace of God, it won't be while you're a young child or whatever. But, that, that could, but, but I, don't think you, I don't think you throw that out to a kid too early and let them, you know, have to ponder that and try to carry that baggage. You know, uh, Casper Ten Boom, he was this guy, Corey Ten Boom, who wrote, wrote the, the Hiding Place, uh, apparently was the wisest father. When I, when I read this or heard this, I was like, I'm a terrible dad. Uh, he, he, he was amazing. He, 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 his daughter asked him one day uh, about sex, and I would say, this applies here. And his answer to her was, uh, he, he said one thing on one occasion. He said to her, honey, um, she was afraid of death. This was the first one. She was afraid of death. And, and he said to her, you know, honey, don't, don't be afraid of that. He goes, when does, um, uh, w when does daddy give you the ticket to the train? And she said, he sa she said, well, right before we get on the train, daddy. And she said, he said, exactly. He said, God will give you what you need when you need it. You don't need to worry about that right now, Okay. But when you need it, God's going to give you the ticket and the grace that you need. Okay, there's other times when she asked him about the issue of sex, and his answer to her was, you know, she said, what's sex? And he didn't answer her. He said, honey, he said, see my, see my, my bag here, this big giant, you know, back in those days they had the big, um, you know, crates that, instead, of, instead of luggage. And, uh, and she, he said, pick that up for me. And she's like, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's too heavy, Daddy. He said, Exactly. He said, there's, there's, there's going to come a time when you're old enough to pick that up and you're going to be strong enough. Right now is not the time. So I would say for this, if your kids are young and you've got to decide when they're young and when they're not, you know, when, when they're kind of at that age when they can, but I would be very, very careful not to thrust that weight onto them 
when they're too young. Mm -hmm. Let them let them grow, and then they're going to start to see things. There's going to be moments that God gives you where you can talk about death. A grandma dies or something like that. You know, uh, somebody at school, there's a death that happens there, and you can begin talking about that. But I would be, I'd be very, very careful not to, uh, not to let them uh, maybe have that conversation too early. Yeah. Okay? I think it's good. Good. All right. Thank you, baby. Yeah, you're welcome. I appreciate it. Let's give her a hand. Okay. Let me just take it to Katie. Bye.